Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, I am calling this evening's public forum to order at 6.45 p.m. My name is Chris Pia, Stratford Town Council Chairman, uh, and I'm asking Ms. Paquette, Council Clerk, to still have somebody signing up, no problem. Oh, wow. We'll wait for, wait for that. Thank you, Marco. Just a reminder for everybody, um, a couple new faces. So the way the, the public forum works is every, every each speaker uh, either must be a town resident or a business owner in town. And um, each person will be given, each person will be granted three minutes to speak at a topic of their choosing. All right, so the first on the list tonight is a, is a Mr. Mark Hannon. Mark, you have three minutes, sir. If you could just state your name and address for the record when you come up. Thank you. Uh, good evening, I'm Mark Hannon. Live at 35 Blakeman Place uh, here in Stratford. I am president of Arts Alliance of Stratford and I am here to introduce those of you who are unaware of the Alliance uh, that in our 14 years in Stratford, under different names, we have grown tremendously uh, in our reach and connection to uh, the, our local arts community. I just wanted to make everybody aware of some opportunities for local artists. We have a monthly arts networking meeting, which happens the first Tuesday of each month. These are free to attend to anyone with an interest in the arts. They include a monthly challenge, which is based on a theme, and attendees can share creative projects they are working on, uh, whether it's a work in progress, recently completed work, or just to ask advice for a project that is stalled. Uh, we have a special announcement at our October meeting to introduce our strategic plan. That will be Tuesday, October 5th, and all are invited. Uh, the Arts Alliance of Stratford has been in the Stratford Public Schools. We were invited by the PTSA uh, to develop Arts Adventure Days for Lordship School and Stratford Academy. We brought in artists, musicians, actors, found ob object artists, and others to develop fun, creative projects for the students throughout the school day. And we hope to return to the Stratford Public Schools when it's safe to do so. We have formed a partnership with Sterling House Community Center. Uh, we have an interesting art show that's gonna be coming up in November. It's called Creative After Hours. This is a non-traditional art show where the artists work in occupations that are unrelated to the arts but follow the creative muse uh, after hours. And for this event, Sterling House will be part of the Bridgeport Art Trail. We are also partnering with Tom Dillon and Councilwoman Shake. We uh, partnered with Tom to produce uh, Make Music Day on June 21st in Shakespeare Park. We had two stages, including the town's uh, mobile stage. Uh, and we had uh, 456 people attending the free event, the free event. Uh, we are also developing pro uh, art projects with Tom Dillon and Suzanne Kachmar to spruce up parts of Shakespeare Park. And we are count talking to Councilwoman Shake about an open air painting event in Longbrook Park uh, and uh, a show at Town Hall which will display the, uh, the work. To learn more about Arts Alliance of Stratford, visit artsallianceofstratford.org. While you're there, sign up for our newsletter and look for the links to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you, Mark. Per Did per I just hit like three perfect timing. Wow. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, is that my Mr. Chairman Chris? Is that is that microphone on? It, it, it's on. If thank you, thank you, Mr. Tavares. The microphone is on, and just as a reminder, um, friendly reminder, just. We heard you loud and clear, Mark. Just speak a little bit closer into the microphone, being that obviously everyone's got masks on. So, uh, but yeah, we got it, Paul. Thank you. Okay. Um, hold on one second. Yep. I'm going to go by the list, Lind. Next person who signed up is Miss Barbara Heimuck. Um, and again, if you could just state your name and address for the record, please. Can you hear me now? 
Barbara Heimlich, 91 College Street. In reading today's agenda, there are several things I have questions on. The first one is, I would like to know why there was a cost overrun of close to $11,000 for electrical service on West Broad and Linden Streets. What was the electrical service for and why was there a cost overrun? I noticed that you also talked about grants that we are looking at. I'm assuming that Greg Riley has actually submitted the paperwork on these grants, and if so, when we, we be notified that we received them. The grants are for policing services, uh, learning the latest de-escalation techniques, FEMA fire prevention and safety grant, and the state historic Pre preservation for a survey and capital needs assessment for the Sterling House. I went through the American Rescue Plan and was extremely disappointed. In reviewing the listing of projects to be funded by the American Rescue Plan, I found a glaring lack of money to be allocated to updating and running broadband high-speed fiber optic cables throughout the town. 150,000 for tree removal. Have you even talked to residents about tree removal? Tree removal is not a popular program in Stratford. There is no plans to replace any of the trees taken down, and I haven't seen any tree stump grinding done. And there's a lot of complaints about that. The American Rescue Plan was designed to immediately impact, was, was designed to, for immediate impact on families, nonprofits, and businesses and job training, which took a hit during the pandemic. I didn't see any funds allocated to meet that criteria. How and who developed this list of funding? Was there any kind of input from the residents on what we should spend this money on? Did the nonprofits submit ideas and requests? And to close, my last comments are on a posting that was posted at 3 o'clock this afternoon on Metro COG's informational meeting on Wednesday for comments on the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. CEDS. I first saw the posting this afternoon, and in total, to make a comment on Wednesday, written comments only, residents providing they see the notice would have to read and digest a hundred, total of 110 pages of material. How long is the opportunity to submit written comments open, and will these comments be published and the results of the study released? Thank you very much. Next on the list is Mitzi. Mitzi, you're up. Mitzi, you're up. And don't worry, we won't start until you get to the, to the podium. Take your time. Oh, my name is Mitzi Antezzo. I live at 367 Windsor Avenue in Stratford. Uh, basically, I gave every one of you a note, which is going to be ba what I, I'm going to say, actually. Um, by congratulations, since the last time I came, there were many fewer people. I'm glad to see so many people here to uh, listen to public input. I'm concerned about the underground parking proposal for the development on Sutton Place. The water table test, as I understand it, was done last spring, and we had a very dry spring. If you look in the records, you'll see that we were two inches below normal for precipitation in the springtime. And at that time, the water table showed a level of 12 feet below ground level, which they deemed was perfectly fine to permit parking under apartments. Since then, we've had significant precipitation. In July, if you recollect, and I might have been the first, we had five inches of rain in 24 hours. More recently, the torrential rains flooded many streets, and precipitation totals to date are almost a foot above normal. 
and I included 44 inches to date compared with 32 inches of normal. Water tables are influenced by precipitation. And I want to know, has a more recent test been done for the water table? And I want to also know if the town of Stratford has a financial arrangement with the developers for underground parking, what would our financial responsibilities do if cars become flooded? And I also thought after I wrote this, do, would we have any responsibility for repairs or for fixing uh, something that usually comes with a lot of water, mold? So I, those are all things to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Mitzi. Next on the list, uh, Kathleen Callahan. Hi, everybody. My name is Kathleen Callahan, and I live at, in the 10th District at 271 Castle Drive. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairman Pia and the other distinguished members of the Town Council for the time to speak tonight. I'm here to share my thoughts on the American Rescue Plan, a once-in-a-generation investment opportunity for our town that I believe requires community input to set priorities and a focus on something I spoke about to this council last November, racism as a public health crisis. Then I said, racism is a social determinant of health, causing inequity and disparate outcomes in many areas of life. While not a new situation, COVID-19 has highlighted this health divide with people of color in Connecticut bearing a disproportionate burden of illness and death. The Connecticut Council of Municipalities, the largest nonpartisan organization of local leaders across the state, crafted a toolkit that provides guidance on how to best allocate this funding. They encourage expenditures that include addressing racial inequities and disproportionate harm by identifying and addressing pre-COVID barriers to growth. CCM also recommends that local leaders convene all stakeholders in the community and build consensus about needs, resources, and priority setting. Previously approved capital improvement and equipment may be key components of our local annual budgeting, yet not necessarily the best use of these funds. I urge this body to not rush to allocate this money to existing priorities, but rather to step back and examine the total picture of our community's needs. Indeed, the CCM states that we should in be intentionally planning our horizon for this funding through 2026. American Rescue Plan dollars are the Willy Wonka golden ticket, a gift from the federal government to help recover from the pandemic while investing in projects and people who have not been the focus before. We can not only recover but grow when we change our perspective to include ideas that never make it to the decision table. I thank you all for your time. Next on the list is uh, Jen, Jen Bedai. Hi, Town Council, Jen Bedai, 173 Woodcrest. Is that loud enough or too loud? I don't know. Um, I am here for a couple of items. Also to discuss the American Rescue Plan and this fantastic toolkit. I hope you've all had access to it. If not, I've got a QR code that I'm happy to share with you. It's a um, very easy to use guide that is very clear and comprehensive as to the recommendations for how these funds should be used, how they should be allocated, and public input and how we can engage citizens to ensure that the funds are spent properly. Thus far, I've not seen that type of activity. I've talked to people coast to coast for what's going on in their municipalities. People have received surveys, they've been invited to forums, there has been a lot of interest from the public in having their voices heard. Haven't seen that yet in Stratford. Look forward to hearing from town council on this. Um, the next item I wanted to mention is, since I've been coming to these meetings for, I don't know, 10 years or so, the mayor has never been in attendance for the, the uh, public forum. I've been very vocal about, I think that the mayor should be here. And then more recently, the mayor has not been in, uh, there is a section that used to be in the agenda, which was that uh, the town council responds to the public forum comment. Haven't seen that. 
Um, it was taken out, and it's a piece I missed. There was sometimes a little bit too much back and forth. It would make sense to me that there'd be a limited time for the town council to respond, but there should be some response. We're coming out here, we're taking the time, we're showing up early so we can make our voices heard, but we have no feedback loop. So very similarly to the American Rescue Plan, where are the citizens engaging with the municipal government? Thank you. Next uh, on the list, uh, Stephanie. Stephanie Phillips, please. Good, e Good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Stephanie Phillips. My address is 41 Yarwood Street. And I really want to talk about a narrow issue that has been around for a while, but I'm really here to ask earnestly and sincerely for your help. The South End, particularly, there's about 15 streets that flood every time there's a heavy rainstorm. It doesn't take a you know, major event like uh, the last two or the one that's coming, any time it rains, they flood. And we've had the engineers out and they say, well, you know, flash, uh, fresh park, fresh pond, you know, overflows and backs up, the area's depressed, it's in a flood plain, and the pipes can't, you know, allow the, the water to exit. And there's all these really good engineering reasons that we have this problem because we're depressed, we get that. But it's costing the homeowners hundreds and hundreds of dollars. We're pumping out our basements all the time. It, it, we do it so often that when you say, oh, I don't hear a lot of people talking about it, it's because it's become part of life, just like Louisiana, you know? You, you just live with it. And, and I think there's things that we can do. Now, when I was on a council, and even before me, all right, this, I'm not pointing fingers, but we always said, yeah, the problem could be solved, but it takes a lot of money, more than a normal budget can handle. I'm asking that we have one use that you look at for the American Rescue Plan. Now, I don't want to give you a hard time. Look, we're talking about putting parking garages in and we're putting abatements in, and that's all fine. Yeah, I'm not here to criticize that. But what I'm asking is that while we're building these new things, all right, trying to make our town better, can you look at those of us who are still here struggling to try to keep our homes safe? I mean, it's so bad that cars can't pass. The police have a regular sheet that they come out and they put up the horses because we can't pass. It's so bad that if there was an emergency, even the emergency vehicles couldn't get through. This is a known issue. Anybody that lives, and this is something that has nothing to do with politics. I don't care whether you're one party or the other. Water doesn't care about your party affiliation. It cares that there's a place for it to go. Now, there are some solutions out there. One of the biggest is, and I've been doing some research, they're called catch basins. They're, but everybody's familiar with the small ones. They're huge ones, and I ran out of time. I'm sorry, sir. Can I finish if up? If you can wrap up, Steph, one? no problem. There are these huge catch basins, and, and they're mega sized. And they're a couple million dollars, and you put them on a the street, and you dig up the street, you put them underneath, and they catch the water and disperse it when it's lower. I'm asking you to look at that and ask and direct the engineering to make that one of your projects. Thank you very much for your time and my overage. Thanks, Steph. Is there anybody who is in the audience who has not had the opportunity to sign up that would like to speak? Linda, if you want to come up to the podium. Just state your name and address. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Linda Palermo. I live at 46 Street in the 5th District. Last month I came before the council and spoke with regard our settling claims with our attorney as a means to say time and effort for the town people. This month I will say that as a result of the failure to do such a thing and not follow 
the ordinance. I will be grieving one, if not three, town attorneys. In addition to this, I'd like to say, I wrote a complaint to our attorney general regarding our complex, not having any low income housing. I was approached by a state rep that I should send them a copy of that complaint. That I am in process of answering and putting facts into that complaint, which I have experienced by living in Stony Brook Garden. I feel Stony Brook sorely needs income housing. When I first moved into Stony Brook some, uh, in November the 4th of 1982, for use and occupancy of my apartment, I had to pay $75 a month. Our costs have escalated to us now paying $493 a month. So we need legislation to help, and I'm hoping that the legislators will act upon my request. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak who has not had the opportunity to speak? Sign up. No? Okay. I'm going to call the public forum. Closed at 7.06 p.m. And we'll reconvene at 8 p.m. sharp right here for our regular scheduled council meeting. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everybody. We're going to begin tonight's meeting. My name is Chris Pia, Town Council Chairman, Stratford, Connecticut. Uh, and I'm going to call to order the September 13th, 2021, regularly scheduled Town Council meeting. Before we begin, I'd like to just ask uh, the body and uh, everyone in attendance for a moment of silence for uh, Mr. Dick Richard Kennedy, uh, who passed away, who was past commander of the VFW uh, Local 9460 in town, and a very good friend to the Stratford community for many years. I ask for a moment of silence. Thank you all. Um, invocation pledge, Councillor Poisson. We pray, O oh Lord, for all those in our community who are responsible for our civic welfare, health, and security. May we only have a care for what will promote good government. Help us, each one, to do well the work we have to do for the good of all. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. Okay, first item, first item on the agenda is approval of minutes from the regular scheduled meeting of August 9th, 2021. I'll entertain a motion to approve. Mr. O'Brien, I have a second. Laura Dancho, second. Seconded by Ms. Dancho. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion passes 10-0, full house tonight. Okay, uh, under item, Everyone can just silence their phones for us. Thank you. Um, under item 3.1, we have a letter of resignation uh, for informational purposes only. And I'll call up the town finance director, Ms. Dawn Savo, for the monthly TAN report. Dawn? the TAN report on here and I don't have it in front of me. So if you uh, look at the TAN report uh, in your package, this is our cash flow 
for the year. And if you go to the last page, it shows you what the estimate is for the end of the year. Uh, the last projected week for the end of the year is 624, and it shows a total cash uh, balance of 7.6 million at that point in time. And then if you go to, we always include the next two weeks because there are bond payments, and then you'll see it's reduced um, in July to uh, negative 4.6 million after we you know, make the bond payments at the end of the year. But then additional taxes do come in at that time to offset that. Okay, any questions for Dawn on this monthly TAN report? Mr. Ken? Thank you, Chris. Hello, Don. Uh, the nugget of 4.6, that will be alleviated like a few, right about the same time by the yes. next year tax collections. Yes, and, and also this does not, as in last month, it doesn't include any bond funds yet at, at this time. For we the bond? We didn't, we didn't um, include any borrowing here. We did approve bonding for this fiscal year, so we expect that will add to our cash balance. Right, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Ms. Sable? No, thank you, Don. Next up uh, on the agenda tonight is the mayor's report. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Chairman. For a COVID update since March of 2020, we've had 5,809 confirmed cases, 158 deaths, and our contagion rate dropped from 16.5 uh, 16 uh, 16 per 100,000 for 4 percent positivity. We've had 70 cases uh, three weeks ago and 50 cases last week, so it comes to 120 cases. 65, almost 66% of our eligible population have been vaccinated with one dose, and a little more than 60% are fully vaccinated. Vaccination clinics will be held at Birdseye Municipal Center from 2 to 4 p.m. this week, and 3 to 5 p.m. the weeks thereafter. The Health Department will be hosting family events and senior-focused coffees in Census Tract 804, where our vaccination uh, percentages are lower. Regarding storm events, Henry, Henri, excuse me, and Ida, the town recently contended with two storm events. Tropical Storm Henri was predicted to hit us as a Category 1 hurricane, and thankfully, its landfall was further from us than predicted. Its intensity was greatly diminished by the time it struck. Despite this, we did experience heavy rains, localized flooding, and storm surge at coastal locations. Interestingly, the remnants of Hurricane Ida passed through afterwards caused greater damage with heavy rains, localized flooding, and some elevated wind. In both events, public safety and health and public works personnel were all hands on deck for the preparation and response, and I thank them for the work they did in making Stratford prepared for these storms. And their response to, to the calls and resulting um, experiences for these ensuing conditions. During the conditions of localized flooding, there were many motorists who tried to pass through flooded waters, particularly under viaducts, around emergency blockades that were placed there by the police department. At least 25 individuals had to be rescued from these locations after their vehicles stalled out trying to drive through the flooded water. It bears reminding that if a blockades are placed, in front of flood waters, motorists should avoid driving through these barriers. During the storm event, when Ida passed through, there was significant flooding, particularly in areas that we had not seen flooding before. Our public works department had ensured cleared storm drains beforehand, but with already the elevated water tables and the saturation from previous rains, the tremendous amount of rainwater that was deposited in such a short time overwhelmed the storm drains. Many residents also experienced some flooding, many have never had to contend with before, owing to the extreme amount of rainfall in such a short time in the ground that was already saturated. On Friday, September 10th, the town was designated as a Purple Heart community by the Military Order of the Purple Hearts Connecticut Department during a military appreciation night at Bunnell High School. This happened before their Friday night football game. 
The Purple Heart represents the men and women in all military service who have been injured or killed in action against an enemy of the United States. The event honored Stratford veterans who had been awarded the Purple Heart. The designation was made by the town because of our unique dedication to acknowledging and honoring these patriots who served our nation, especially those killed or wounded in battle. The town was presented a plaque from the Military Order of the Purple Heart, which will be placed in, on display in these chambers. I would particularly like to thank Councillor Bill O'Brien and the members of the Veterans Museum who worked to put together this special evening. Thank you, Bill. On uh, September 11th, it was the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and a special thank you to VFW Post 9460 for hosting the town's annual September 11th memorial at a ceremony on Town Hall uh, on, the, on the Green. And to all of our outstanding police, professional police, fire, EMS, and dispatch personnel who participated in the ceremony. Nearly 3,000 innocent lives, civilians, and first responders were lost on that terrible day 20 years ago. We must remember them, as well as those who answered the nation's call to arms following the attack. The town of Stratford vows to honor and keep the memory of those we lost that day. The town of Stratford and the Stratford Hispanic Heritage Committee held the 16th annual Latin Music Festival yesterday, sponsored by Paradise Pizza at Paradise Green. The celebration of Latin culture showcased performances by notable, notable Latin bands and professional folklore dance groups over a dozen vendors, including food trucks, arts, crafts, booths, community organizations. Radio Cumbre, 1450 AM, broadcast on Paradise Green Gazebo, and the Griffin Hospital vaccination van was on hand. We are lucky to host such a unique event in town, and I was pleased to see so many residents enjoy the sounds and flavors of this year's Latin Music Festival. I want to thank everyone who joined us on the morning of August 31st at Town Hall to recognize International Overdose Awareness Day in a ceremony that was organized by my office, the Stratford Health Department, Stratford Partnership for Youth and Families, Confident Health and Recovery Network programs. International Overdose Day is organized to remember the loved ones lost by overdose and to end the stigma of drug-related deaths. Here in Stratford, overdoses have claimed the lives of 18 of our residents in 2020 and six so far in 2021. The town renews its commitment to help those suffering from addiction and their families and to bring an end to the unnecessary loss of life that addiction brings. A special thanks to Reverend Patricia Collar of the Christ Episcopal Church, Christina Trani of Recovery Network of Programs Inc., Donna DeLuca of Family Matchmaker, Confident Health for joining us and they're sharing their personal stories. As many of you are aware, the country of Haiti experienced a massive earthquake that was followed by tropical storm damage. I want to thank resident Marie Denise Jean for being the one kind of force for good that makes Stratford the greatest community it is. She worked in collaboration with the Haitian United Fund to raise awareness, funds, and supplies for Haiti in the wake of the devastating earthquake that took place. I was pleased to join her at her home uh, last month on a fundraising drive and thank her for her work and contribute $1,500 from the mayor's charity to this great cause. The town's Household Hazardous Waste Collection Day will be held on Saturday, October 30th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Stratford Public Works Yard, which is 550 Patterson Avenue. Stratford's Household Hazardous Waste Collection Day is free of charge to Stratford residents. A valid Stratford resident sticker must be presented at the entrance prior to offloading materials. To obtain a resident sticker prior to the event, please contact the Recreation Department at 468 Birdseye Street. Stratford is, is one of the limited number of communities in Connecticut to offer this, and it is critical that our residents have a safe and easy way to dispose of their household hazardous waste. The list of items that will be accepted or denied are, can be viewed on the town's website. Due to the growing number of events planned through September and October, the Celebrate Stratford team is postponing the Stratford Arts and Culture Festival to the spring of 2022. The Town of Stratford will once again recognize Hispanic Heritage Month with a ceremony on Town Hall Green on Wednesday, September 15th, 2021 at 9 a.m. With the Stratford Hispanic Heritage Committee, we will ring in Hispa Hispanic Heritage Month, which runs from September 15th to October 15th and the flag of Hispanicity will be raised at Town Hall. 
National Hispanic Heritage Month celebrates the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens who have ancestry originating in Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, Central, and South America. The popular farmer's market at Paradise Green continues, held every Monday from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Those attending the farmer's market are welcome to park in the back of Stratford Baptist Church on 131 Huntington Road. The the church asks that attendees keep off the grass. <laughs> we thank the Stratford Baptist Church for providing this accommodation. The popular Shakespeare market continues on the grounds of the Shakespeare property. Twice monthly food and craft market will be continuing through October of this year. The Pumpkin Festival, sponsored by the Booth Memorial Park Commission, will be held on October 16th. The Corsair Car Show will be held on Sunday, September 19th at Two Sniffets Lane from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And that's hosted by the Connecticut Air and Space Center. The Army Engine Plant would continue to work weekly with the developer on zoning, the tripartite agreement, and all the details working towards a closing prior to the end of the year. Regarding Center School, the Selection Committee held second interviews that were open to the public and recorded and on the town's website for Damian Kalinagi slash Spirit and Mark Romano. Following the second interviews, the committee has decided to have an appraisal done of the property. Once the appraisal is completed, both developers will be asked to forward their financial stack and their final, uh, uh, the final proposal based on appraised value of the property. The commercial realtor Baldwin Pearson, who is on the approved RDA list, has given a 30-day timeline for the appraisal. Both developers may be asked if if the timing is correct, to present to the town council for the October 12th meeting. The Economic and Community Development Office is working with MetroCog on the contract plating RFP. And we have some upcoming Celebrate Stratford events that are a little different than we've had before. Um, Discover Strange Stratford tour tours will be held on October 24th and 31st. The tour will sh share 13 mysteries along Main Street starting at Perry House and it, it will be done uh, via bus and trolley. Ticket sales will go toward Benefit Booth Memorial Park, Stratford Historic Society, and Perry House Foundation. 495 uh, Lordship Boulevard, FedEx is moving into a small portion of the building to get through the holiday season. And after the holiday rush, they will move into the entire building. We had some business openings. In August, late August, I was pleased to welcome uh, Chubby's Bar and Grill to Stratford. Owners Chris and Julie Delmonico have located Chubby's at 1212 Stratford Avenue at the corner of Beardsley uh, and uh, Stratford Avenue, two blocks from Main Street. And last week I was pleased to welcome Emerged Home Care of Connecticut to Stratford for their grand opening on 2067 Barnum Avenue. Emerged offers homemaking, companion, personal care assistance, adult and family living, and offering hourly and live-in options. They are a highly recommended provider for the Connecticut Home Care Program for Elders, which is Title 19 and Medicaid. Please join me in welcoming this great team of caring professionals to their location here in Stratford. We are also ha happy to welcome Force 3 Pro Gear to Stratford, relocating from Milford to the new location on 240 Hathaway Drive. Currently, Force 3 Pro Gear employs 30 people, and they are planning to expand and grow to 100 employees. The Stratford location will be distribution, e-commerce, office, warehousing, and a showroom. Force 3 Pro Gear is a maker and dis a dist distributor of pro sports equipment, Ma and many of their products are currently being worn by professional baseball catchers. They are focused on reducing concussions and other sports-related injuries with a focus on developing better protective athletic equipment. That's my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, questions for the mayor? Open it up to uh, for the council. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Tavares. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Councilor. I wanted to talk about, uh, since we were talking about the flooding issues, you know I had a meeting with uh, the town engineer, John Casey, and Michael Downs back in June, I believe. Folks in, in those areas of Masaryk, Garibaldi, Harding Avenue, Everett, that part of South End was suffering for decades with flooding, not just the unprecedented storms, but just when there's been heavy rain. So is there anything in with the upcoming uh, infrastructure uh, bills coming and any other funds coming? Is there something of paramount that will deal finally with maybe putting in pumps 
or some way to alleviate the constant flooding there. The, the people there are, are just really, I, I share the anxiety of them even when there's a forecast of heavy rain. So is there anything in the plans to at least give these people a fighting chance to alleviate the flooding even with just heavy rain? Yes, thank you, Councillor, for, uh, for that question. Um, as you know, the areas that you mentioned, Access Road, the water treatment facility, are all at a precarious position and prone to flooding. And, and though our land use departments, specifically zoning and Jay Habansky, have worked very hard uh, to get our coastal resiliency rating higher to, um, to help people with their cost of insurance, we know that we have to put in a physical barrier protection at the plant that will also help our environmental justice zone, which is some of these areas that you're talking about. So we have received a grant from FEMA, which is a portion for the dike cost that's approximately $7 million, and we received a grant for $2.4 million. And in our development of this project, we have scheduled it for four phases, of which we've submitted um, the proposal to Senator Murphy to help us um, help us craft this funding mechanism so we can get these projects going. So it's a it, it's a, a while coming. We do have it in our capital improvement plan to fund the balance that's required by FEMA for that dike. Um, we are also planning through CDBG and uh, Tara mm -hmm. Petroselli um, flood insurance seminars with uh, Doherty Insurance, who's offered to construct these with us. So it will give these homeowners a different option for flood insurance. So they're maybe not paying as much as on the market, and they, they do have some options. As we progress through um, the American Rescue Plan grants, we do have uh, opportunity to use money for these issues. However, um, and, the, and uh, Don Savo, Chris Timniak will talk a little bit more about it later, but we've met with Governor, uh, Representative uh, Congresswoman Delora's office, and uh, they have told us about infrastructure grants that are coming down the pike that we can apply for, and these are exactly the, the applications that they would like us to address uh, to help folks that are in those very low-lying areas mm -hmm. at sea level um, and, and even though you've identified some um, in, in your uh, council constituency area, there, it's all throughout town. Oh, yeah. And, it's, and, and I, I know you know that, but um, I think about Orange Street every single time that it rains because uh, it's, it's very difficult. And, um, and the, there's benefits of living on the coast, but this is not one of them. One last question, sure. Chair. So, Mayor, people will, those people in those affected area will get some sort of information on what's, on, on what's going on with what you just said? With the, with the FEMA insurance, absolutely. So Tara is um, working with Chris Timniak and Kyle, and also it'll be through CBDG, CDBG, so you'll also be involved in it mm -hmm. um, to offer these options to, to people. And just the education piece of it sure. as well, yeah. We look forward to that, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from councilors for the mayor? Mr. Ken. Thank you, Chris. Um, this is regarding ARPA and just some short background. The ARPA toolkit, you know, describes some parameters and recommendations. Uh, one of them is public hearings, uh, third party consultants to ensure transparency throughout and economic lifelines to live vulnerable people and businesses so we do not hamper future uh, growth and progress. Half of the items on what we'll be voting on tonight were previously categorized under ARPA, but the other half were part of the CIP paid for by bans, short-term bonding. Now, my question is, for the balance of the ARPA monies, will you commit to having public hearings so that members of the community can participate and how the remaining funds would be allocated within the parameters. Thank you, Councillor, for reading back the CCM uh, guidance that I was part of creating. 
We've had public hearings on what is in the CIP and CEP plan, and we will continue to keep the transparency open. Unfortunately, we only had two or three people comment when we had public hearings, because we also had it not only at the council meeting, but we had it at the ordinance meeting. But that was before um, endorsements were made for running for office, and maybe people weren't as aware of what we were voting on. So uh, as we proceed through this, and as we share information going forward, and as we are as transparent, not as building materials, happy to accommodate you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Any other questions for the Mayor? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Shake, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have two questions, one in relation to Mr. Cannon's um, request. Um, I would also echo, and I hear what you're saying about having um, things discussed during ordinance and um, collectively when we had those meetings back in May, correct me if I'm wrong, into June. Um, however, to also include perhaps surveys like other municipalities are doing to engage further with our community so that the remaining amount of money that will still be available that we have to and basically invest in over the next five years includes that process. So I, I echo Mr. Hans' um, sentiment. Do you have a question, Caitlin? Do you have a question? No. So my question if you can was, it, please. I'll repeat it again, that in the following process of how we're going to be allocating the remaining funding for ARPA funds, that we do include more public comment, and then we also include surveys to our residents so that those who cannot actually come here um, have hey, a way you need of to actually... Ask a question, though. That was my question. Okay, thank you. Through you, Council Chair. You may. Thank you. So as I have mentioned to you in the past, and as you have done, every time there is a grant, you approve it. And you approve the process, and you approve the dollar amount, or you amend it. And as with ordinance, and as with the budget, it's presented to you, and then you hold public forums or public meetings or communicate however you wish. And I would encourage you to do that in the future because I think the public participation is critical. Thank you, Councillor. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Hang on one. I had a second question. Hold on one second, Ms. Shake. Any other questions for councillors who have not spoken? Last question, Caitlin, go ahead. Um, my question is in regards to what has um, coalesced over the last month since we last were together here in this chamber. And it's, of course, centered around our COVID response here in town. Um, my question is from feedback that I have gotten from residents and also from business owners um, in regards to the mask, updated mask mandate that we have. So um, my question directly to you, Mayor Hoydick, I'd like to know why the mask mandate uh, only included public buildings and not businesses as well. Thank you for the question, Councillor, through you. Go ahead, Madam Chair. Good Madam, Madam Mayor. None of our surrounding towns but Bridgeport have a total mask mandate. And the air doesn't stop from one place to another. And with, with as many responses or questions that you have gotten, I've gotten four regarding having a mask mandate in businesses. Conversely, I have gotten less than 50 from businesses thanking me, like modeling the governor's policy of letting them decide what is best for their employees and their customers. Thank you, Madam Mr. Mayor. Chairman, can I follow up? Um, now we're going to move on, Caitlin. Thank you. I can't follow up my inquiry. No, no. What's up? All right, go ahead, and then we're going to end it. Move on. So, For quick follow, up, Caitlin. Thank you. So, in your opinion, do you think that the town of Fairfield, Easton, and Westport, who did implement a full mask mandate, including their businesses, did not make the right choice? Through you, Mr. Chair. Madam Mayor. Thank you. The first selectman 
of all those communities are managing for their communities. Easton has very few, if any, commercial enterprises, so it's not relevant to them. However, First Selectman Marpy and First Selectman Kutch Kupchik are managing things differently. If you will remember, both of those communities closed their parks, closed their public areas, and people did not have access to them. We did not. So I would never, never cast aspersions on how they're managing for their community. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Next item under committee reports is going to be item 4.3.1. I'll entertain a motion. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Zero point seven. Uh, if it's okay with the town attorneys, I'd like to uh, combine A, B, C, and D as one item. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to approve items 4.3.1 A, B, C, and D, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Councilor Poisson. Do I have a second to that motion? Second. Mr. Seconded by Councilor Hardin. Uh, any discussion? Um, this was through, done through Public Works. All the minutes from the meeting were provided in the pony. Seeing none. No question. Uh, I'm going to call it, Greg. So. What? I'm going to call the vote. I didn't well, see any. Chris, uh, Chris, you've got a, at least a second or two. A second or two, please, before you like questions. No I need questions. a second first, so hold on one second. Yeah, let me second. All right, second on Ms. Dancho. Thank you, Ms. Dancho. So for discussion, Greg, like to discuss? Um, yes, thank okay. you. Apologies. Apologies for the... Uh, <clears throat> First item, uh, meeting minutes are good, but they do not contain the results of discussion. So I'd like to reach out to appropriate person related to abandoning in place an unknown 500 gallon tank. Why abandon it versus removing it? Uh, it, was, uh, it was cheaper. Cheaper. Mr. Yes. Hold on one second. Mr. Timiak, if you can come forward, sir. Shed some light on it, please. And Renee's here too, Chris. I don't know if you need Renee for that. Renee's here as well. Um, I actually have the uh, building um, or the meeting minutes from John Casey. It was filled with sand. It, I mean, it's been disposed of the correct way. Uh, it would cost more money and basically compromise the surrounding structures to pull it out. It's very common to abandon an oil tank, fill it with sand, and let it, let it be. All the appropriate tests were done, and um, you can check the meeting minutes to give the full detail. I don't want to get into reading the entire thing, but. Oh. Thank you for uh, that the risks of any leakages have been mitigated. Uh, thank you. Yes, it's being, it's being dealt with appropriately. All right. Any other discussion on the items? Okay, seeing none, we'll call for a vote on items 4.31, A, B, C, and D. Uh, I'll entertain, excuse me. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion passes 10-0. Uh, Mr. Town Attorney Hodgson, how are you, sir? Very well. Thank you, Chair. I have a, a brief report of August activities. Um, we collected $35,000 in unpaid real estate taxes. We collected $6,700 in sewage uses taxes to dispose of two cases. We had paid out uh, some WPCA sewer backup claims. Uh, and a sewage, sewage drainage pipe claim. We uh, opened up two new files regarding property damage to town property, including uh, two vehicles uh, of the town that were sideswiped. And we have uh, one new blight file for the month and 10 FOI requests. We also have two land use matters, one of which we're gonna discuss at the end of this meeting. And that's my report. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Attorney Hodgson. Uh, uh, ch chair, uh, could we make an inquiry, ask a question? Uh, n no questions for town attorneys. It's not on the agenda, but if you do, you can email them. Uh, okay, so report, but no questions or follow-up are I'm, allowed tonight. I'm following the agenda. Next item on the agenda is item 6.2.1, a resolution. Uh, I'll entertain a motion on that one. Mr. Perlo. Motion by Council Perillo. I have a second. Second by uh, Council Hardin. Any discussion on this? Um, Chris or uh, who do we? Captain Ianotti. Captain Ianotti is here. Captain, if you'd like to provide a brief overview of it. 
because we want to acknowledge the hard work that goes into these. And Grant Riley, Mr. Riley. Point of order, Mr. Chairman, could you please ask that every member that's here in this town hall wear a mask or please leave? Sure. If uh, I ask everyone wear their mask, uh, except when eating or drinking, as posted on the, on the door. Captain Ian Nadi. Okay. Good evening. Uh, Captain Frank United, Stratford Police Department. Um, in brief, um, there's been some new developments with mandated training throughout the state of Connecticut. One of them is um, the introduction or the um, enhancement of de-escalation training for all law enforcement, law enforcement officers in Connecticut. Myself and Greg Riley have um, put forth a grant to pay for that training starting January 1. Um, we have one year from January 1, 2022 until December to train everybody in the department. So this grant would be um, very helpful as far as paying for those costs because we have to bring the whole department in that's 106 officers plus anybody that's ticket enforcement officers and such. So um, that's pretty much it. It's all unfunded new training coming up. Thank you, Captain. Any discussion on the, on the matter? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tavares. No. I heard you first. Thank you. Uh, Captain, this is great. I think that uh, this is some, I'm glad that Stratford is, is in the forefront of, of doing that. This is, goes a long way for establishing the public trust and uh, fully, fully support that. Thank you. Thank you. That is our intent. So, you know, Lieutenant Eller started that and this is just going to build on his program as we go. Any other discussion on the item? Greg? Thank you, Chris. Hello, Lieutenant. Uh, just thinking about the synergies between Lieutenant Eller's, well, the forces uh, program, PAL and PEP, ComCool and Comply, would training like this, once it's completed for the officers, then be disseminated through the community through a program such as PAL? No, this is a law, law enforcement specific. So it's built up in three phases. We've already sent our instructors to training up in uh, Maine, and it's a nationally accepted program through the IACP. And what they will do is through the four block or three blocks of training, four hours apiece, start with de-escalation training, then scenario-based training, and then tactics and skills on how to deal with the public and high stress situations. So it'll be department as a whole at first, and then specific to patrol supervisors, patrol officers and such, and we'll build upon it that way. Thank you, Captain. Any other discussion? I just have a quick Ms. Dancho. About how many hours of training does this entail? The program itself is 12 hours in total, but we're anticipating six hours for the initial training, and then we'll tack on to that with the new state-mandated um, use of force policy, and we'll include that in the training and make it a full day of training, and we have that uh, block to cover as well next year. Excellent. Thank you very much, Captain. Thank you okay. to Mr. Riley as well for the grant. Uh, we'll call for a vote. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion passes 10-0. Next item on the agenda is going to be item 6.2.2. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Perillo. Motion by Mr. Perillo to accept that. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Ms. Shake. Um, let's see. So we'll call for, excuse me, discussion purposes? Any dis uh, Chief Lampart or Deputy Chief Jermaine Atkinson? Yes, sir. Welcome up, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, in regards to this um, fire prevention award grant, uh, we were awarded a $63,936,000 dollar project with a federal share of 60,000 and a town share of 5%, $3,045. And the purpose of this program is to install a combination of 240 uh, smoke and combination carbon monoxide detectors in conjunction with a bed shaker device for the hearing impaired community. Um, this uh, program is for the actual detectors, for the actual devices, and we'll be using the installation through the on-duty crews so it wouldn't cost, incur any additional cost uh, for installing the detectors to uh, assist the community. We have a uh, selection picked out through the fire marshal's office, which works with uh, the smoke detectors that we purchased. And this also enhances the Red Cross program that we currently have in place for the past two years, providing community smoke detectors 
uh, for uh, needed residents. Any discussion on the item? Mr. Tavares? No. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. I think, uh, well, smoke detectors, I can't say enough what, what it means for uh, the early detection and saving lives. But uh, there's actual one that is a bed shaker device. Uh, I've been out of the department for a while. I mean, can you describe that? Yes, sir. Uh, what it does is there's a device that goes underneath the mattress and it connects to a um, device which hears the smoke detector. And what it does, it gives you a visual flash. So it allows a hearing person, hearing impaired person through a lower frequency to shake the bed and wake them up. They look and see the flashing light and then they're alerted to call 911. Uh, based on the smoke detector going off, uh, it's similar to how a, a normal smoke detector would go off using an audible. This works in conjunction with it so that if there is an alert, the people are able to wake up and activate the 911 process and then we will respond from there. Do you have a, is there where, maybe I can, I'm kind of curious, is there a demonstration that I can see at some time, go by the firehouse or? Uh, at this time, I'd probably have to look into that because this is a specialized technology. Uh, we had the ability to do this with the Red Cross, but it was a special call. So it would be a special call for it because the cost would be $500, which is the normal cost oh, of uh, Red Cross. Yeah. And it would be a special call that you'd call the fire marshal where they would come out and do an assessment of it specifically to do so. Uh, and this one is going to be a lower price because it prices out at $266, which accounts for the full amount of the grant. I think I use one of those to wake me up. <laughs> I think it's excellent. That's excellent. Thank you. Deputy Chief. Madam, Madam Mayor. When, um, when you do install one, if the resident is amicable to it, maybe you could invite the counselor to see it. Absolutely. <laughs> We'd be more than happy to do that. Any other discussion? Go ahead, Greg. Thank you, Chris. Uh, how many hearing impaired <clears throat> households do we have in Stratford and how do we uh, keep track of them? Uh, in accordance with our normal smoke detector program, at this time I'm not aware of how many there are because that was a special call. To the best of my knowledge, the Red Cross has not been activated to do so. Uh, I'm sure I can look through that information through the fire marshal's office, which had identified a need to do so. Uh, and how we track the program is when we send the members out, we take a demographic sheet that goes with it that gets filed with it. Right now it goes with the Red Cross. So that allows them to come back out and monitor this program and it contributes to the longevity of the program. Uh, so by us doing that as well, taking those information, it logs into the computer and we have a system that populates uh, an expiration date. So when it populates an expiration date, it allows us to feed the program continuously and um, be able to go back and resupply those households that need it as the time frame comes up. Most smoke detectors are good for 10 years so that's the longevity of the program should be, it's projected to be 10 years. However, if there was a time where there was a problem with the smoke detector, they could simply call the fire marshal's office or the fire department and we would come back and keep them up to speed and make sure that the community was safe and protected. Any other discussion? Uh, Deputy Chief, just want to say thank you for everything you guys do. I actually got an email from a resident lordship about two weeks ago who said they were out walking their dog, stopped by the firehouse, they came over within five minutes, helped them install a smoke detector, and they were, just couldn't say enough nice things about how professional you guys were. So thank, thank you. you. We appreciate that. Awesome. We're going to call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion passes 10-0. Next item on the agenda is item 6.2.3. I'll entertain a motion to approve. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Dancha. motion to accept a resolution regarding Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office Survey and Planning Grant 2021 in the amount of $20,000. Okay, so I have a motion by Councilwoman Dancha. Do I have a second? By Mr. O'Brien. Uh, any discussion on the item? No? Okay, another great grant. We'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed, motion passes 10-0. Next item on the agenda is item 6.2.4. I'll entertain a, entertain a motion to approve. Mr. O'Brien. I move resolution 6.2.4 regarding the American Rescue Plan Act. Thank you, Councilor O'Brien. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Mr. Uh, Mr. Perillo, I have on the second. Uh, discussion, so for discussion purposes, I'm gonna ask uh, Dawn Savo and Chris Timniak to come up to the microphone to walk us through this.
Thank you, uh, Chairman. Oh, thank you, Chairman. I feel really muffled. I wore, I wore my really heavy mask. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, so, as has been previously mentioned, um, this resolution identifies the projects that were in the capital plan that was previously reviewed and approved, and it also includes projects that were identified for short-term borrowing and some um, emergency equipment replacement and AED items that were identified using EMS funding. And I just wanna, I wrote some talking points, so I hope you'll in, indulge me on speaking about this uh, plan a little bit. Um, just as a broad understanding, the town of Stratford was awarded uh, 25.9 million. That's coming to the town in two tranches and the funding is split up between the Treasury, the US Treasury and the state of Connecticut. To date, we've received 5 million and some change from the state portion. That was the first tranche from the state portion. And we were notified last week that the Treasury is releasing 7.9 million, which um, together those make up the 12 million roughly that is the first tranche of funding. Uh, that just comes to us and um, we then have to report on that at some, at some point in time. Right now we have no reports due. Uh, the funding period is March 3rd through December 31st that you could use the funding. The funds must be spent uh, through December 1st, 2026, and have to be encumbered as of December 31st, 2024. So you can encumber something in December 24, but then you still have time to spend it. The proposal before you tonight is um, what is what was proposed is to avoid the town having to go out to bond or get short-term financing, which is more costly, and to use this to make these capital purchases. The reason these were identified was because these uh, were because these were, uh, reason we included the bands is because these are purchases that are needed sooner their short-term purchase, you know, they were normally funded through short-term borrowing and they're needed sooner. As you're aware, a lot of towns in the area across the entire U.S. are making these, are making similar purchases. So for example, fire apparatus. Everybody's going to be buying fire apparatus. We're trying to get a little bit ahead by being able to put these orders in because as you know, due to COVID, there's supply chain issues and everybody's going to be putting orders in. So there's a, you know, there's a timeline um, to getting these items after you place the order. So by approving this, we're able to, the departments are able to get these orders in and continue providing, you know, these services to the community. The other thing I wanted to mention, because there was a lot of discussion about this and these were talks that we had internally as well, that we did talk to Congress, um, Congresswoman DeLauro's office. And there's a lot of funding that's going to be coming through different channels. For example, there's 140 million that's uh, projected to come for capital projects in the state of Connecticut. There's an additional you know, 450 million that they're saying is going to go for roads and bridges on top of the normal allocation that comes through the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, that President Biden has extended the FEMA COVID disaster period through December 2021, which then makes testing and vaccination expenses 
reimbursable for this extended period. These are things that our health department is currently doing that could be reimbursed through other funding besides ARPA. Uh, there's rental assistance funds that the state is going to make available to all towns in Connecticut. Um, the state is also going to receive an additional 15% of hazard mitigation funding, which could be used towards coastal resiliency projects, which is something we talked about earlier tonight. Um, CDBG Home Program is getting additional money that can be used for home repairs. Broadband connectivity is going to be a project that the state is going to fund. Uh, we were told that. So um, I'm just saying this because there are many sources of funding and there's channels that they're going to be using, grants and other channels through the state. So we want to make sure we're using the funding strategically. These projects were chosen because they don't really fall into those other categories and we want to wait and see what kind of money is made available over time and so we can, you know, I use it um, to the best advantage for the town. Um, so that's, you know, that's my explanation for why we included the bands. I hope that you will see that we're trying to be as strategic and as transparent as possible. And, um, you know, the fund that we did set aside a fund, you approved that previously. We had two meetings and the council um, unanimously approved the setup of the fund, which currently we have the five million in. So nothing's been spent to date and I hope that you will approve this tonight. Thank you. Mr. Timniak, anything to add, sir? Yeah, I actually, I do. Um, uh, a couple things. One, I know that uh, there's a sense based upon what I'm hearing and reading in the newspaper and what I heard today at um, uh, public comment. You know, there's a lot of things I'm seeing, which is exactly what I told the council was going to happen back in May when I stood here at this and I talked about the CIP plan and the importance of, hey, listen, these projects, we think we can do this. We don't know for sure, but be ready. I'm going to come back to you with a plan and I'm going to come back to you. Hey, this is approvable. This isn't approvable. And I also warned or let the council know and let the public know via letting you know that this is constantly changing. One of the reasons why we delayed the vote on the CIP and CEP was for this specific reason, so that we could come back to you in September with, with solid details of what is approvable, what we, can, what we know we can um, put in the program and what the federal government will approve us spending the money on, and what we should hold off on. And tonight I heard broadband, broadband. You know, Congresswoman Delora's office was very clear that the infrastructure bill coming forward is going to present another funding opportunity, which we shouldn't spend the, the ARPA money on because there's infrastructure dollars coming down the pipe. And I do, I look at, I look at other towns. Uh, I know Dawn and myself combined have probably been on 15 hours each of worth of uh, you know, federal conference calls, state conference calls, CCM toolkit workshops, this, that, and everybody has a different angle of how they want to do it, right? My thought is what we chose to do back in May is trending exactly the right way. When I look at other towns already allocating their full allotment of $32 million or other towns saying, hey, we're projected, you know, we got a city right across, you know, our neighboring city, we have a projection of all this money. This is what we're going to spend it on. Well, those plans are shaking out right now. You know, we're still waiting for the federal guidance to come. And with all the details, the best we can do is continue to listen and see what other towns are doing. So when I, when I look at the broadband, when I look about um, how the other towns are spending, we have a plan. We have items which have already been vetted by the town council. Uh, we've already had public hearings on it. And here we are tonight getting approval for the first piece of the plan. And this plan is gonna be living for the next three years. And we're gonna be constantly making adjustments based upon what the federal government guidelines are, what the town needs are, 
right? To be able to sit here and predict what our needs are going to be in a year or two years um, is, is tough to do. To, I mean, I, I can put a pretty solid list together, and I think we all can. But what's missing on what we all know is how we can further leverage this money, which is the most important thing. And, and, and again, we can leverage this money with Greg Riley applying for grants, um, with Rob Klee here applying for solar and energy efficiency projects. This is an opportunity which I'm grateful as the town CAO to be able to have my arms around and, and work this together with the residents of Stratford, with the mayor, with the town council. So um, I look forward to answering any specific questions you have about the project tonight, but to paint a broader picture of why we're standing here today with the projects listed in front, I hope that helps. Thank you, Chris. I, I'll just start first start off on the comment that First off, I, I think you guys have done a great job doing your due diligence because that's the key word on this and not jumping the gun um, and really vetting it out. And, and I don't want to, I know all of us speaking to everybody up here don't want to do anything wrong or illegal um, because I know this is still shaking out from Washington of how this money can be spent. Um, and I also got to, I want to say thank you because I think it's a great um, thing that you, Madam Mayor, yourself or the administration working across the aisle and speaking with Rosa Dolores' office so much on this because I think she was head of appropriations that this came through. So right. you're getting it from the horse's mouth. So thank you. Um, I'll open it up to the council. Can uh, Mr. Poisson? Chris, can you just um, just explain what Dawn said? What I think is the most important thing that spending this money here instead of going out to bond is saving the town money. Is that correct? Exactly. Right. So we won't be bonding for projects we know we can cover on a grant, which is what we we you know pay for. And when you look at the entire list of everything this ARPA fund is supposed to include, this is exactly the reason to do it. Um, you know, Rosa Delora's office talked. Of, I mean, everything about um, you know community parks, community art, community um, infrastructure such as fire trucks and things things along those natures. I mean, this is part of that package. There should be no hesitancy about supporting this type of, um, these type of projects whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, uh, discussion for Mr. Demiak? Greg? Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> uh, hi, Chris. Uh, yes, we had public hearings. We approved CEP and CIP. And thank you for pointing out the EMS and the low SIP and the bands that we approved to be the payment mechanisms for these projects and it will save the town money to use federal funds as a substitute. So we all agree that these items listed have been vetted and are necessary uh, for this time. Uh, my elected question, there's some other items that the community needs that are, seem to be included in ARPA. Can we add items, for example, uh, a strategic marketing plan to help economic development, a tourism plan or activities to support tourism. We talk about triage therapists for the health department, uh, mobile crisis teams for the police department and the community services department. So those items are soft structural investments which would help the community health and possibly economic prosperity. Could we add 50,000 for this or 50,000 for that as seed money towards an eventual larger decision on how we want to move for things like tourism, uh, crisis prevention, and structural changes for economic prosperity. Uh, could you add it tonight? Yeah, well, yeah. I, if I made an amendment, would we be able to afford it? Yeah, we mentioned seven million, five million. I don't know about the cash Low. Well, you mentioned a couple things on that list, which which I would caution against. And you know, one of them, like the health triage. You know, the health triage. COVID's a hundred. COVID expenses are hundred percent reimbursable. We don't have to use this grant for this. And the same thing with the tourism dollars. That was also mentioned in Rosa Delor. That there's going to be other opportunities coming a loss, uh, coming around. I think we just have to, you know. W definitely wait in the next two weeks when the, um, the federal guidelines come out to see what, what's in here. I know you mentioned earlier about hiring an administrator, like you could hire an administrator to do this, okay? 
As far as I know, there is no COVID or ARPA money administrative you know, resumes out there on the books. This is something we're all going through for the first time. And as I talk to other you know, town managers or CAOs or first selectmen across the town, that's across the state, that's something which is really funny because here you have a, basically a cottage industry which is about to explode on all this stuff and the rules haven't even been written yet. So I think a lot of, a lot of that is, is an early uh, a talking point to encompass how big this is, but I think it's some of the, one of those things that we sort of just have to wait. And by waiting, like, I mean, I'm not saying wait a year. Let's, let's, let's wait a couple months, let's wait a couple weeks, let's see how things settle down, and let's see what, what the best bang for our buck is. You know, right now, there, th that pressing urgency for like a health triage, we can take care of that without touching this ARPA money today. So that's my, that's, that's my sort of uh, overall thought as I stand here shooting from the hip on that to answer your question, Councilman. Any, any other discussion? Chris, I agree to your point. We're, we see this as it unfolds. And like you just said, New and Dawn, Treasury releases more guidelines within, a, within 10 to 15 days. Let's see this as it develops. That's, that's the right thing. That's my opinion. Rose's office promised us a 27-page plan, which is going to hit, like, hey, you can do this. It's indicated on page 157 of the document. And one, once we get that, we're basically calling it the Rosetta Stone of, of ARPA from Congresswoman uh, Delora's office. Uh, once we get that, we'll be able to basically have verified, hey, listen, this is in front of you because this is where it says we can spend this money. And, you know, let the mayor, let, let the council decide, let the public decide what the best course, um, best course to, to do this. And Any other discussion? To close, Go ahead, Greg. Um, Chris, thank you for the explanations. Yeah, we've already vetted these items and, and approved them under town bonding. We can save town money in the immediate time frame. Uh, and thank you for your commitment to get all the information from the feds so that we can continue, continue to participate in how the rest of the allocation will be prioritized. Any other discussion Mr. from any Chairman. other counselors? Ms. Shea. Uh, Mr. Timiak, first I want to say thank you to you and Dawn because I know that you have worked extensively um, on, you know, navigating through this process and it's obviously a very challenging because things change quickly as COVID has taught all of us. Um, I follow with what Mr. with what Councillor Can um, was inquiring and moving forward with the remaining balance of what will be available for the town to invest in. Um, would we then collectively be able to say that we will have uh, public comment and provide surveys to our community members, even to, to go back to our department heads to ask what else they need, whether it's public safety or it's our Department of Health? So uh, when you, the way you phrase the question, you're sort of phrasing it as if we haven't, we, we, ha we didn't do that for this first step. And I want to be I'm very, not saying that. But I'm just, like, the way it came out phrased, I want to, like, I'm, I'm reading that, that you're indicating that we didn't go through that process with the first, with the first step. And, and I want to just assure the public that we did. We did it. New, in fact, tonight was also a public hearing on, you know, the ARPA was included in the agenda for tonight's meeting. So the, the public has been involved in what we've done up to this point, and we have been very transparent on, on, on what that is. So I want to be... I want to sort of push back on the way that I thought the question was phrased. Moving forward, absolutely, like we're going to continue to have the public involved uh, to the extent of putting a survey together, an entire encompassing survey of everything which is included in this could get really, really chaotic. So we may want to talk about narrowing down different sections of things, but there, there's, certainly, there's certainly an avenue to, to, to drill down to get to get the best use and the, the best valued opinion from the majority of the public who want to participate. Right, and just to be absolutely clear, because I did not make any accusation or implication that the process that previously took place was something 
That did not include public comment because as Mayor Hoydick reiterated several times during her comments earlier that we went through ordinance and we had those opportunities. Um, my question was moving forward because there is concern from the community that they would like to be more involved in this process that we, again, collectively are going to commit to making that available through public comment, through surveys, just like our housing partnership provided surveys to our residents. It is possible. Um, and I think that we have a longer timeline to be able to do that. So I'm just asking yeah. for your public commitment to, to do that with all of us. Yeah, we will certainly continue to solicit input from the public and, and hold public hearings um, on items which, which we put forward to the town council. It's, it's part Thank of the town you. charter. It's required. Any other discussion? Mr. O'Brien. Thanks again, Chris and Dawn, for giving us some facts that we don't see in many of the newspaper articles we read. And a lot of surveying is being done already. I'm very approachable, whether by email, by phone call, in person. And I think, I think and I hope everybody here is. And I get a lot of different requests to look at this or that. But the number one thing are trees, either dead trees or branches that need to be cut down. And I know Kelly Kerrigan, our conservation officer, has a tremendous list that she's trying to keep up with. So I'll, despite what somebody said earlier about trees, it is a big issue. And this number two is getting my street paved. We probably all hear that too. And the town does a great job of paving. We have a good system. Um, I was in Milford recently and couldn't believe how bad some of those streets were. So maybe their taxes are lower, but there's a lot of things they don't do. They don't pick up uh, every week during the summer branches and all that. They don't pick up leaves in the fall. So every town, I, everybody I talk to in every town, they're not happy with the taxes. So. You guys keep up the good work and keep saving us money. And you're not going to take the opportunity to advocate for the Sterling House right now? You don't want to add that to the mix? Okay. Make it a yeah, okay. Uh, any other discussion for Mr. Timiak on this? No, I agree. Great job, Dawn. Thank, thank you. you, Chris. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we'll call for a vote. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion passes 10 0. Uh, next item on the agenda is under new business. Uh, we have item 7.1. I'll entertain a motion. I, Ms. Stancho? Following the same theme of uh, saving our town money, I motion to accept item 7.1, the solar polar, tech, polar voltaic project at five schools, and that the contract be awarded to the lowest bidder, Con Ed Solutions, in the amount of $2,503,000. $545.48. Um, thank you, Ms. Dancho. Um, do I have a second to that? Mr. O'Brien, um, we'll have discussion. So, Mr. Timniak, yes, Mr. Klee, I believe, is here, who is our solar energy consultant and has done a lot of due diligence on this. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Klee to join us. Uh, and if you can give us a brief overview, um, Rob, we'd appreciate it. If you could just introduce yourself, too, for the council. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, members of the council. I'm Rob Klee of Klee Sustainability Advisors. I am a uh, consultant to the town along with my partners at CSW Energy. And I'm uh, really happy to be here tonight. So thank you to the council. Thank you to the chair, to the mayor, and all the town staff that has helped along the way to present this uh, results of our recent bids for solar projects at the five schools listed uh, on your agenda. Uh, as you can see, through our competitive process, we solicited uh, four competitive and qualified bids from around the region. And through that competitive process, managed to end up with a, a very competitive price of around 2.5 million. And you might recall that this was originally approved by the town council for up to $4.3 million in funding for all five projects. And again, that's kind of like the MSRP sticker price of what, or the sort of worst case scenario. If you look at the, the four bidders, that last bidder was more in that $4 million range. But through that competitive procurement process, we managed to attract uh, really competitive prices um, from Con Ed Solutions. We did evaluate to make sure that what they were pitching is actually the highest quality standards, meet all of the industry standards, and they do. So this is, again, uh, a real boon for the town uh, through that procurement process. Now, there are going to be two sets of projects. The first 
two to go will be Bunnell High School and Stratford Academy because their roofs are already done. They're all brand new roofs and the solar can go on right away and they will be scheduled to get final design approvals from DAS and go to construction this fall. The Worcester Middle School, Chapel Street, and Second Hill Lane Elementary Schools will go next summer. The roofing, uh, re-roofing has to happen first and that's um, part of the DAS grant is for a re-roofing followed by solar due to some uh, COVID supply chain issues that re-roofing is delayed till next year. But in our bid process, that was clear to all the bidders that they knew that those roof had to happen first on those three schools before the solar project goes on. So they are gonna get to do work this fall and then continue work into next year and hold their prices. The last thing I wanna mention, again, this is another saving to the town. All of these projects qualify for the DAS reimbursement. These are part of the school construction grant process. So the 2.5 million is what the town has to pay initially, um, but they are reimbursed at a rate, which I looked up today, was 59.64% plus or minus uh, uh, from uh, DAS. So overall, um, we were really pleased with the uh, bids that came in and the competitive nature and the quality of the, uh, the ultimate uh, winner. And I'm happy to answer any further questions the council may have. Thank you, Rob. Uh, questions from the council for Mr. Klee. Um, Mr. Here. Tavares, I think I know what you're going to ask eventually, but go, go ahead. I'll give you the floor. <laughs> <laughs> those, uh, those fees are locked in even though it's for next year, correct? Correct. Yes. Correct. And we, we've talked with uh, Con Ed Solutions to ensure that. And the energy credit savings will be forwarded to the town or the energy savings credit that the panel will produce? Yes. So these uh, are behind the meter solar arrays built on top of each of the schools. So they will be net metering at the, right. the school site. Plus, they've also qualified for state incentives through the ZREC program as well. And those ZREC's have been secured for all five towns. So that's an additional state uh, utility incentive for going solar that the town will benefit from as well. Mr. Paul, Chairman, let me interrupt is that what you bet it? Is that what you bet I was gonna say? Uh, it was, and actually I was gonna ask one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Thank town you. Attorney, I'm just gonna ask one question, just because in Paul, to, just because of the past solar uh, in terms of recusing, I just didn't know if this one would have to be something for you. Just looking out for you, because I know in the past you've had it. Well, I was gonna abstain anyway. Okay. So, but yeah, maybe that's a question for the attorneys. That would be based upon what you've indicated in the past when these items have come up. Uh, you abstaining today again would be appropriate for the same reason. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion on the item for Mr. Klee? Go ahead, Greg. Uh, just a question for Don or Chris, please. Uh, have we bonded the money for this project yet or... Uh, or uh, The answer is no. Thank you, Don. And is, is it 60% paid by the state DES? And 59.64 uh, would be the reimbursement rate from the state for the school construction program, and we only bond when we are in, you know, when we're doing the project. Perfect, um, Mr. Cleef. Thank you for providing the valuable service. Thank you. My pleasure. Any, any other discussion? Rob, I'll just thank you as well. Um, your, your experience in, in this field and in work with not only the town and the state, uh, we appreciate it as residents and taxpayers, so thank you. And it's been a pleasure working with all the town officials and the school board officials uh, have been really helpful all through the process. So thank you. Thank you, Rob. We'll, we'll call for a vote. Oh, Mr. O'Brien, go ahead. And One question that always comes up about low bidder versus high bidder, and you're confident the low bidder can do as good a job as a high bidder. Yes, we, we are. Con Ed Solutions is a, they're based in uh, uh, Westchester County, New York. They are part of the larger Thank Con Ed. They mm -hmm. are a, uh, a very uh, qualified, reputable solar installer installing uh, across the country, frankly. Um, we're, we were pleased that this is, I think, one of their first forays into Connecticut, um, but they are uh, extremely well respected in the industry. And what has become a very competitive market helps too. Yep. Mm -hmm. And there won't be a bunch of change orders where you, where you have to add more money? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to make any promises uh, right now. But um, no, our goal throughout the process, and this is part of the service we're providing the town, is to be the town's representative. Um, we, along with my partners at CSW Energy, um, they have the 
technical installation background and expertise to really keep uh, an eye on these projects and make sure they're delivering exactly what they promised and uh, doing so in a timely and efficient manner. Thank you, Rob. We'll call for a vote. Thank you. All, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? Abstain. One abstention. Vote goes 9-0-1. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is item 7.2. I'll entertain a motion for approval or acceptance. And we'd like to make Mr. Perillo. Okay, motion by uh, Council Perillo. Do I have a second? Hey, Mr. Chairman, okay. before you get a second, if we may ask that the, the movement add, uh, that that be approved subject to the title being approved by the town attorney's office. Mr. Perillo, if you'd just like to state that. Okay. As stated by Mr. Town Attorney LeClaire. Okay, I know that's what you said. And I'll second. Uh, and we still have a second from Mr. Councilwoman Dancho. So discussion, um, Town Attorney Jackson, is this, this one yours? If you can give us a brief overview, sir. I'll do what I can with this mic microphone. Um, the, the Catherine Novak has approached the town. She's been, oh, this has been in her family since the 1970s. It's a small lot, that even our own assessment shows it's $800. She just wants to give it to the town. She figures the best thing for it. I'm for it because if she, we just don't, if we say no, she's just going to stop paying taxes, and at some point we're going to pay a town attorney to foreclose it and take title to it. So it's better if it's in the town for free than having to pay ourselves to take it back. Makes sense to me. Uh, can you just give can you just give a little description of the proximity as to where it is? Uh, I know it's on, it's, it's on Access Road. I've given a I think in what I gave was a little map. It's it's just right on the water. Oh, that's where it's right by the airport, so it, there's a little bay in here. So it, it really is a very small, non, you can't build on it. There's not much you can do with it. But I'd rather not have it on the foreclosure list if we can avoid it. And Mr. Timiak, was there anything further from your office? Because I know this is something you worked on with him. Okay. So it was only that he was approached, if I may. Gotcha. Gotcha. I just want to make sure. Um, discussion for the council. Um, Ms. Kane. Just a clarification, uh, the, the map, I, this is uh, at the end of the airport between Main Street and the Marshland or Short Beach? No, I it, think it's a access road against the, I think it's a off access road by the marsh, but I don't know where along the way. So there's no proximate owners per se, it's not developable, it doesn't have any value to anyone except maybe as open space? Probably, unless you could combine it with another lot, but I don't know. I just thought if we, we assessed it at $800, I thought we'd go look at the title and make sure it's clear and that they own it. And then at that point, if, if, we, if the town takes it, then the town has a lot. It, it'll be one of those ones we'll own in, in perpetuity, probably. Mr. Tavares. Thank you. Yes, yes sir. Oh, not finished with you yet. Um, is, but at some point, this could be developed for something like, uh, you know, would it be a walkway, a park, or? I, I can't tell you because I've never actually seen the lot, but okay. I would assume if you combined it with other things, it could do something in the future. I think the idea is if other lots come available, you could then do something. Right now, it's sort of a small lot that sits in an odd position. So close to the water, I don't think you're actually going to put any kind of a building on it, but if you wanted to have a if you got the adjoining lots at some point, could you put a walkway or something? I'd, I'd imagine you could. And for the record, if there's, you know, for tax purposes, what would that cost the town approximately a year? Your best Taxes guess. Is that $800? Your, your, your best guess. I mean, 20 bucks? <laughs> $220. For an $800 lot? If you, I'm sorry, $22. If there you, you look at, <laughs> if you look at, if you look at, if you look at the, um, at the uh, public records, it's it's very minimal in tax law. Yeah, and, and thank you. They, the, the family's owned it for years and years and years. And I think she just called the town and said, "I don't want to pay taxes on us anymore." I guess that's rare. Thank you. Any other discussion? Let, let me just Mr. ask a question. I'm surprised Ken hasn't asked. Is it big enough for a soccer field? <laughs> no chance. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Jackson. We'll call this for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion passes 10-0.
Uh, next item on the agenda is item 7.3, which is going to require executive session being requested. Um, I'm going to need a motion to go into executive session as well as listing uh, the normal characters as we always do for executive session. And Mr. Town Attorney Hodgson can, uh, or LeClaire can assist with that. So I'll entertain a motion for that first. Would someone like to help me? I Ms. Dancha? need to make that motion to go into executive session on item 7.3 with all of town councilors present including Mayor Hoydick, our town attorneys, Florick Hodgson and LeClaire. And Jackson. And Attorney Jackson. And Mr. Tim, yeah, I don't know, who else? Am I missing someone? Mike Downs, raise your hand. And the motion should indicate uh, the reason for executive session is discussion of this property in a public session may affect the purchase price. And property. with that following statement, as eloquently stated by Attorney LeClaire. And probably and Dawn's yeah. finance director. Oh, and Dawn to attend as well. Okay. Uh, do I have a second? second. Mr. O'Brien, any discussion? All those in favor? Chair votes aye. We're going to executive session.
I'll stay for the vote. Okay. Let's go. Okay, we're coming back in uh, from out, excuse me, I should say, coming out of executive session. I need a motion to enter, uh, return from executive session. Motion to come out of executive session. Thank you. And to proceed, or do we need to vote on that first? We could motion to return first. Yeah, motion to, re motion to return out of executive session. I need a second. Sec second by Mr. Hardin. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And Ms. Dancho, if you'd like to. Uh, yes. Motion to proceed as discussed with the attorneys in executive session. I guess the motion would be to authorize the uh, chief administrative uh, officer to proceed as discussed in executive session and to refer the matter of the sale of 313 Honey Spot Road to the Town's Planning Commission for Connecticut General Statute Section 8-24 review. Ms. Dancho, sound so, good? So moved. <laughs> Do I have a second? <laughs> Mr. O'Brien, second on that. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. aye. Chair votes aye. Any opposed? All opposed, motion passes 10-0. Uh, next item on the agenda is going to be item 7.4. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. O'Brien? Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Uh, do I have a second? Ms. Dancho? Um, any discussion? Um, I just want to thank the, the Planning Commission for the favorable recommendation on this. This is a wonderful thing in the first district that um, for many, many years, I've been hearing echoes of residents in, in that wonderful little um, neighborhood asking about the historical perspective of it and asking for a formal resolution. And um, a few years ago, a few of those residents brought it forward to me and uh, I'm thankful that everyone worked together as well. I'd like to thank John Casey and Susmitha, who uh, Susmitha put a lot of time and effort into historical research on it, so thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Greg? Um, through the chair, maybe to the attorney, does his, 
excuse me, uh, does this designation provide any s special legal rights or privileges or accesses? No, this is not, this is just a neighborhood designation. It's not a historic district. It's not a historic neighborhood or any of those options under the state statutes. Just a resolution. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion passes 10 0. Uh, next item on the agenda, item 7.5. I'll entertain a motion to approve. Well, Mr. Vares? Uh, yes, I'd like to vote to approve, but I have some questions. Under discussion, but okay. I need to move the motion first. So, motion to approve? Motion to approve. Motion made by Mr. Tavares. Second by Mr. Connor. Seconded by uh, Mr. Connor. Uh, discussion. Paul, if you want to open up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I kind of got excited when I saw this because I know the current state of, of the, of the uh, Julia Lowe just is, is not acceptable. My only question is, is this the same configuration that was shown to me during Arbor Day when I spoke with you, Madam Mayor, and uh, Ms. Senna? Perhaps maybe she can... Uh, Renee, if you... Renee, the Director of Public Works, you've been patient all night. If you could join us. Paul, if you'd like to refer your question to Renee, Thank to you. Ms. Sarah. Good evening, Ms. Senna. I was just wondering, when we talked at Arbor Day and you showed me that diagram, because I haven't seen it since, but was that exactly what was planned for, for this, uh, for this? This, 60 is, this is what we discussed there and probably a little bit more uh, added improvements to it. So we kind of started out with what we talked about, removing that one structure that's kind of uh, blocking the entrance to the new pavilion. And uh, we added fixing the roof of that second pavilion to make another useful space. Uh, so it's probably exactly what we talked about and then an, a little bit more. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Any other discussion on it? Seeing none. Uh, seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion passes 10-0. Uh, next item on the agenda is item 7.6. I'll entertain a motion for Mr. approval. Chairman, I'd Mr. Like Connor. To move the uh, resolve that the council approves the funding for a successor collective bargaining agreement with Stratford Police Union Local 407 to commence July 1st, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. Um, second by Mr. Perillo. I saw your hand, sir. Um, any discussion on that? This, uh, Madam Mayor, thank you for working on this and we want to thank the police department as well uh, as, as well as their board for um, getting this approved madam mayor if you'd like to add anything on it well attorney hudson also worked very very closely and hard on this uh, contract so thank you attorney and the human resource department mr and thank you to the union any, any discussion from the council uh, i'd just like to make a comment mr connor now, after 10 years on this i've seen these contracts drag on over and over for years and back pay i know bill would agree with that and this one went fairly smoothly to be a, effective in the same year literally in the same month and ken probably could tell the same thing about board of ed it's really a great job that everybody did thank you mr connor any other discussion mr kane um to the limit that we're allowed maybe to mr ing uh question is how do the terms compare with the current agreement and well do we foresee this agreement attracting new hires improving retention of current officers the contract is comparable it's um, actually less uh, overall wage increase than the previous contract that we had with the four-year so it does allow for the town to save money we feel that the, the negotiations that we went very well and both parties gave up a little bit and conceded a little bit to make it sure it works. So the contract is favorable to retain people based with the, obviously on the salary. Uh, we did w give them a little bit more on some other time off stuff that they, that they would look for because of the hours that they work. So I think it was a mutual agreement that uh, everything worked out well for both parties. Any other questions for Mr. Ring? And thank you, Ron, for thank your work you. on it. All right, uh, we'll call for a vote. I, in, in honor of this tonight, I wore my pal Matt face mask, so thank you to the police department. We'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion passes 10-0. Thank you. 
Uh, last, uh, excuse me, next item on the agenda is item 7.7.1. I'll entertain a motion to approve. Mr. Chairman. Mr. O'Brien. I move that John Dobus of Stratford Road be and is hereby appointed a member of the Public Safety Committee of the Stratford Town Council to the resigned seat of Paul Aurelia with a team concurrent with the 2019-2021 council term. Okay, motion to approve by Mr. Uh, O'Brien, seconded by Mr. Perillo. Uh, any discussion on Mr. Dobus? His application was provided uh, in the pony. Nope. We thank him for stepping up in his service. We'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? No opposed. Motion passes 10-0. Motion to adjourn. Mr. Poisson, do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Tavares. All those in favor? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you all.